Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my variety vlog for November 2017, and it's essentially the BGGCon blowout episode, because I'm pretty much just talking about BGGCon and the 20 new games that I played at the convention. I've kind of ranked them in the order in which I like them. Um, I have a couple other regular segments, but you're not going to see any questions and answers in this one in particular, so uh, feel free to skip ahead a little bit if you'd like, or stick around for the whole thing. As always, let's start with a very brief Patreon update. There were three people who added into the campaign over these last three weeks because I'm actually filming this a week earlier than normal because next week is going to be crazy with work. But either way, thank you for the additional support and let's now move into the main update for this last month. Realistically, this is just Board Game Geek Con. It was a wonderful time. It was my fourth time going to the convention and it did not disappoint. Um, it's never disappointed. I just love this convention because it's essentially a four-day straight um, game day. You know, we just wake up at 7 in the morning and game all the way until 1 or 2 in the morning and then go to sleep and then wake up at 7 a.m. to that alarm and get breakfast and rush over to the hot games room. It's it's a ridiculous thing, really. It's like uh, we're in La La Land. It's a different universe where you just don't even leave the hotel. The food is all there. The food isn't amazing, but whatever. I'm not a picky person. I'm fine with eating chicken tenders every day for four days straight. It's just a great way to play tons of games. I think I played around 30 or so total plays, and as I mentioned, I'll be covering 20 new games that I played um, uh, later on in the vlog. And yeah, it was just a great time. I knew a bunch of people who were out there, specifically from our greater gaming group in the Bay Area that, that flew out to Dallas. There was like 11 or 12 people there. Jessica came for the second year in a row, and she really enjoyed it again. It's just a lot of fun to just play games like crazy, and I certainly did a lot of that. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and wrap that up and just start talking about some games. As per usual for this Games of Note segment, I have organized all of my new plays over the last month from the ones I like the most down to the ones I like the least. This is actually just the new games that I played at Board Game Geek Con. Uh, I did play Magic Maze this last month, but I've got enough games to cover right now. We'll talk about my first impressions of Magic Maze in the next vlog. So either way, let's go ahead and jump in. And the number one game of the convention for me was Agra. And this is a bit of a surprise for me. I did not even go into Board Game Geek Con thinking it was likely that I would get a play of Agra in because, well, it looked beautiful. I mean, this is a gigantic game with uh, stunning art all over the place. Uh, it's got these uh, large pieces, all lots of uh, wood. And you actually construct a piece of the uh, board so that's at an angle and everything kind of sits on it and it looks beautiful. Um, but when I looked into this one before I went to uh, Spiel, I decided that it was probably going to be too heavier for my, uh, too heavy for my tastes. I am a medium weight Euro gamer. I love medium weight Euros. And this one looked like it might just be more than I wanted. And it was also really expensive and really heavy. So I decided not to grab a copy at Spiel and didn't really think twice about it. And then we were, I think, two or three days into BGG Con and my friend Matt was like, I read the rules to Agra. I'd really like to play it. Let's just um, be at the hot games room at 8 a.m. and try to nab a table and play it. And I said, you know what? A lot of people are talking about Agra. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. And it completely blew me away. <laughs> I mean, I think I probably said 10 times throughout that game, just like, oh my gosh, this game is amazing. And like 15 minutes later, I'm like, oh my gosh, this game is amazing. <laughs> and it took us three hours to play it. And that about matches what I've heard other people say. So this is not a short game. It was a, um, a first time play for all four of us around the table. But those three hours zoomed by like, the decisions that I was making were just great. And so anyway, let's talk about how the game plays a little bit. It is set in um, in India. I'm not really sure the exact time period. I believe it's before the Taj Mahal. So quite a long time ago. And you are generating resources and then you're going to spend those resources to hire nobles and invest in different um, uh, trades and then get points for that. And it's just very euro -y in its theme. But mechanically what's going on is it's a worker bumping game. And I didn't expect that. Uh, you essentially place, you have a worker and you place them down onto the board. And if there's somebody uh, else's worker is already there, you're going to bump them out and they will get it back into their supply. But um, there's more to it than that. Uh, I've played worker bumping games before and it's a neat idea. Like in general with worker bumping, you keep playing until all of your workers are out and then you have to take a turn gathering all your workers back up again. It's kind of a null turn. Uh, but in Agra, you start with like 10 workers or 15 workers. I don't know. It's just a ton of these workers in front of you right from the get-go, and you send them out to the board and you bump people out, and I never ran out of workers, and I think you're not supposed to, which is definitely a different take on worker bumping. You have so many workers that they will inevitably get bumped by other people trying to do stuff out on the board, so they will cycle back to you, and you're just constantly always deploying workers, which made it almost feel like more of an action selection style game than a worker placement game, because again, you're not denying people those spots, um, but by kicking them back into the area, 
Well, that's nice for them, but if they're never going to run out anyway, they might not care. And the reason that they might care is because you, uh, when you put your workers down on the table, they are standing up and then they can evaluate the action that they went on. It might be as simple as um, take some of a specific resource and you look to your little player board and you can modify it to, to show you how much of a resource you can buy. You move these little farmers up and down. I'm not going to go into the specifics of that, but uh, once you've done your turn and your worker's standing up on the board, if somebody else comes in and bumps your worker off and they're standing up, then you get a little favor token and you put it down onto your player board and you can consume these favor tokens to do a variety of different really nice actions that might just be get resources that you need or you can also customize these and generate new favor tokens um, uh, or new favor token action options, uh, put them on your board and then only you can actually use that spot. Nobody else has that ability. But at the beginning of your turn, before you even place a worker down, you can do a meditation. Uh, uh, it's a meditation phase and you can lie down as many of your workers as you like out on the board and you will generate meditation points, which you can immediately consume to do a variety of things like upgrading your resources or um, increasing the amount of resources you make at your area. You can also, I believe, bump some uh, influence up on your investments tracks. There's just a bunch of things you can do by laying down your workers that you've already put out. So your workers are essentially a, uh, a resource even after you have used them. But if they get bumped when they're lying down, then they just come back to your area and you don't get that bonus trade, uh, um, the bonus favor token. So there is a whole bunch of things going on here and you can actually upgrade your meditation track so that when you lay people down, you get even more tokens to do even more stuff. And on top of all this, you have this big board and you have these arrows that kind of lead from one resource to the next, to the next, to the next. And you essentially upgrade them as you go. You can start with a um, pile of turmeric and you can turn it into maybe curry or dye. And then you could use that dye to actually do some paintings. And as you activate these farther and farther locations on the board, you are essentially pulling the resources along these arrows uh, from one spot to the next, making them better because you have all these little tokens and wherever they're at on the board or in your player area will dictate what they are. If they are over here on your little player zone, it's a favor, but if it's out there on the board, it might be a turmeric or a cotton. And this is where I start to come into some gripes with the game. And this is not a surprise. A lot of people have complained about this. It is a beautiful game, but it has definitely taken form over function when it comes to the overall design. It has this gorgeous art, but the arrows that kind of trace along the board, well, they're really faint. Sometimes they actually go through arches in the artwork, disappear, and then reemerge back on uh, another spot on the board. And you can see it, and it's pretty, like you're pulling this good through the arches of the city, and it's now a much better resource. But it can be a little hard to track, and some of these arrows actually are really close to each other. And you're like, wait, this one goes over to the uh, clay, and this one over goes over to the cement area, and like, which one's which? And then it comes to the actual art on these things. You have a resource, which is a pile of um, yellow stuff with a scoop in it, and you have another resource that is a um, pile of orange stuff in a bowl with a scoop in it. And when you look at the icons from afar, man, these two things look really similar. One is dye and one is, I think, cement. And that really messed up one of the players around the table at one point. But all that being said, all this stuff worked so well together. And I just really enjoyed the game. And I think a big part of that is because it's very loose. Like when it comes to heavier Euro games, I expect um, usually a lot of tightness. Like you do a thing and it's like a huge mistake. Like, oh, why did I do that? But in Agra, it seems like you can always get yourself out of a bind. There's so many ways to generate resources from a bonus here, or a bonus there, and spend some meditation in this way or spend some favors in that way and do this thing to get the thing. And you can pretty much always find yourself getting to where you want to go, maybe just not as efficiently as you maybe wanted to. And that does mean that analysis paralysis could creep in in a big way at certain times in the game. That's definitely part of the reason it took three hours. But overall, I just really enjoyed the experience. Like the decisions, it's hard to actually pinpoint why it's like a lightning in the bottle, a lightning in a bottle uh, type of thing where you're like, it just worked. I just loved all the decisions I was making and I haven't even scratched uh, the surface of some of the mechanics, um, including that angled board where you're gonna be moving these tokens up. I guess I should mention, you have these really tall, beautiful tokens on this angle board and they show your kind of investment level in these areas and it is precarious. <laughs> in fact, at one point, uh, Matt uh, got up to um, uh, rearrange something, put on a sweatshirt or something, and he accidentally bonked the table just a little bit and every single one of those tokens fell down. And fortunately, they didn't fall down far and we were able to infer where they were supposed to go, but this is dangerous. Like, I kind of feel like um, if we were to give a copy of this game in the group, we would almost need to put that uh, that thing on a separate table so it's less likely to get bonked. It's unfortunate that they went with this form over function thing, but either way, this game is stunning. It was so much fun to play. I'm absolutely looking forward to playing this one more.
All right, now we've got game number two, which is Keeper. And again, this is a huge surprise to me that this game is so far up on the list. In fact, this is the last game that I played at Board Game GeekCon. Um, it was kind of a uh, slapdash thing that we uh, put together. Um, Paul Grogan uh, messaged me. He said he wanted to teach me the game. I ended up uh, sitting down. Uh, I got to play it with uh, Jessica, my wife. And I also got to play it with um, Isaac Childress and his wife and uh, Justin, who works over at CGE. And I didn't really know what to expect with this game except for one thing. It's got these flipping boards, like magical flipping boards. I've heard people say it's kind of like um, the little cootie catchers you had when you were in middle school. Like, you know, kind of put your fingers in, and you're like, do, 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 do. And then you kind of pull the thing up and see what your fortune is or what girl you're supposed to have a crush on or something like that. And I heard that that was a mechanic in this Euro game. And I expected it to be like an action selection mechanic, like, you know, da, 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 da. okay, I can now do this on my turn or that on my turn. And that's all I knew about it going into the game. And I quickly found out that that is wrong. Like that was absolutely an impression that was incorrect because it's actually these player boards that go out into the middle of the table that have this effect. And um, I'm going to go ahead and just put a video up of uh, Justin actually flipping through these things so you can see how they, um, they interact. But what happens with these is they lay out in the middle of the table and they become worker placement locations. This is a worker placement game. I did not expect that. <laughs> there are a lot of worker placement games coming out recently. And for it to be number two on my list, obviously it's gotta have some other stuff going on and it certainly does. So when you are playing the game, you have a variety of these different colored workers. And on your turn, you can take a worker and either send them out to one of these uh, flippy floppy boards in the middle of the table, but they don't move and they, don't, they only move in between rounds. So in the middle of a round, you don't have to worry about them changing. You just go to a spot and get the thing. If you send a worker whose color matches the color of the location, then you get to do two activations of that spot. So that's really nice. Maybe you send a farmer over to a location to get grain, and now you get two grain instead of one. Uh, but a really cool thing now is that my turn is not done. I send that farmer over to the green spot, and now I look to the person on my left, and I say, would you like to join me in harvesting some grain? And if they do want to join me, they have to match the color of the um, the farmer that I put down or the, uh, the meeple that I put down, or they can send a white meeple, which is just a wild one. And if they do that, then they are gonna get three activations and I'm gonna get three activations too. So they have used a worker outside of their turn. They've gotten a benefit for it. They are using a worker on my turn, which isn't great, but I get a bonus activation. So I now take three of the wheat instead of the two that I would have taken before. And Maybe I would have been okay just taking two, but I am forced to invite the person to my left, and if they pass, it goes to the person to their left, and it goes all the way around the table until everybody has had an opportunity to join in with me on this endeavor. And that is a really cool mechanic. It almost has a collaborative feel to the game, even though you're forced to do it, and you're not always happy that your opponents are going to go ahead and do that. And so what ends up happening is as you're placing all these workers onto these boards, there's going to be one board per player in the game. So we played a four-player game. There are four boards down the middle. And you have a special meeple that is in your color, and they don't actually activate any of the worker placement spaces. Instead, when it's your turn, you can send them out to one of the boards, and you claim the entire board. And it's important to do this at the right moment because the meeples that are already on the board are going to dictate what you're going to get at the end of the round. When the round is over, you're going to take all the meeples that are on the board, and that'll be your new worker force for the following round. So you don't want to do this super early because then people might avoid that board. They don't want to give you that bonus. But if you wait too long, then people might have already snapped up the really nice spots that have all the wild workers on them. Those white workers are certainly the best because they can uh, specialize in anything. And so it's just another really interesting decision. At what point do I not take a main action, but do I claim one of these boards so that I can kind of customize and um, have control over the specific actions that I'll have available to me in the next round of the game? And you could send every worker out to do any of the, um, the actions, but of course, if you match the color, that's a much bigger benefit. So the game goes over four different seasons, which is essentially four rounds of this worker placement. And between those rounds, you take the board, you take all the meeples on it, it's your new worker supply, but then you can now start flipping around this board to figure out what kind of um, uh, pattern you want for worker placement spots for the next round of the game. And you are restricted by the season, like if it's the summer, then you're forced to use this one specific part. So that means there are four other options if you kind of flip the board around to see. And you might be like, well, this option lets uh, me harvest deer, or this option over here lets me build better. I have lots of resources, I wanna build more, I don't care about deer, so I'm gonna flip the board around like that, 
put it out in the middle of the table and I don't own that board anymore. I have to pull my main meeple back, but that means there are more of those action spaces out that I'm interested in out on the main board. And also when it's your turn, you can take a meeple of yours and put it down onto a worker placement spot on your own private board because you are absolutely gonna be building a whole bunch of tiles onto your private board. Some of them are just gonna give you victory points for certain conditions and others will just unlock new abilities. You can go there and now you can maybe refine resources at a much better rate than if it was out on the main board. Also, at the end of the round, all of the meeples on your own player board come back into your own personal supply. And here is where I come to the last really cool thing about this game that I think has just kind of caught my mind worrying and I just keep thinking about Keeper. And that is that, well, it seems kind of obvious right now, right? You want to take the board with the most workers, but that is not necessarily true because there is an absolute incentive for running out of your workers in your worker supply before your opponents. Because the moment you have no more workers and you have already sent out your main person to claim a board, when it's your turn and you have no workers to do, you can actually reactivate workers on the board that you've claimed or on your own personal tableau. So that means that somebody across the table might have sent a worker over and gone to a mine and got some gems, and then the person to my right, they joined in and they all got a bunch of gems. But then I claim that board later on in the round because I ran out of workers first, I can now activate that mine again and take three gems because they have two matching meeples on there. So I have essentially jumped in on an action that somebody already did. And you're only allowed to do this if other people still have meeple uh, worker placement actions to do. And this is so cool because being able to do these things over again is just a neat extra option to really capitalize on the good moves that your opponents did. And there were many times where I was like, dang it, I have too many workers. And now you are even more incentivized to join in on your opponent's turns where you can to get rid of your workers to more quickly just fully deplete them and then activate the really good stuff again, including maybe the stuff that you've already activated on your player board. This game is so freaking cool. I I really enjoyed all of those different things. I mean, honestly, the gimmick of the flappy board, I'm really take it or leave it on it. I mean, I guess it's kind of cool that you can customize the locations out on the board. And part of me was like, couldn't this just have been done with like just a piece of cardboard? But no, no, I, I understand. Like, you know, every single one of these things gives you all of these different options and it definitely adds something to the game, but it is not the thing that people should be talking about with this game. People should be talking about the wonderful tweaks on worker placement with the joining in, with the reactivating, with being able to kind of customize your worker pool by claiming different spots. All these things were so great. I just loved all these decisions. And at the end of the game, you just look down to your player board and count up all of the coins on your stuff. You maybe got some coins in the middle of the game by shipping some goods and whoever has the most points wins. I lost by one point to Jessica. She had, I think, 96, I had 95. I think Isaac came in with like 93. It was a very close between the top three of us and I just super enjoyed it and I should probably stop talking about it now. But anyway, Keeper is a very cool game. All right, let's go ahead and move on to game number three, which is Gaia Project. And I honestly expected this to be my number one game of the convention. It was the one I was most excited in playing. Like I definitely planned around doing that. We uh, woke up and we were at the hot games room at 8 a.m. on the uh, Thursday to go ahead and get a play in of it. And it took over three hours. Like it was like almost three and a half hours to play, but it was a first game for all of us. And I think we were kind of letting analysis paralysis set in. But that being said, we really enjoyed it. So let's talk about the game itself. It is essentially Terra Mystica in space, but it is not just a retheming of Terra Mystica. And I was fortunate enough to play Terra Mystica about, I don't know, two weeks ago and then like a month before that. So I've actually played Terra Mystica twice in the last month and a half. So I had it very fresh in my mind and I enjoy Terra Mystica, but Guy Project just really seemed to streamline a lot of the issues that I had with Terra Mystica and created just a wonderful game that is definitely a long one, obviously uh, talking about the, uh, the game length, but there are so many different decisions to make. This is uh, just like Terra Mystica, you have these very asymmetric uh, races that you are going to be choosing. This time you are in space and the first thing that really hit me about the difference between the two games is that the board, well first of all it's modular so you can kind of make it different between games, but also it seemed like you're not going to get as locked in as you did in Terra Mystica. Like I really felt like in those games you could just be building your buildings and then you get to the point where you just can't expand anymore at Terra Mystica, but in Gaia Project, you can rather quickly get to the position where you can fly long distances with your spaceships in order to colonize new planets. And I guess that's a bit of a misnomer. You don't actually have spaceships in the game, but you just kind of count the number of spaces that you're allowed to move and terraform new planets and put buildings down. And the second thing, and realistically probably the biggest change between these two games, is the modification of the priest track from Terra Mystica. If you're not familiar with Terra Mystica, you have had this track of four different colors and 
throughout the game, you're moving a little token up it, and at the end of the game, you get points for how high you are up on that compared to your opponents. So it was like four different races. But in Gaia Project, they now have six of these tracks. It's no longer a race. You do get some points for getting to the tops of the tracks, but every single one of them gives you upgrades. It's essentially technology tracks. You have one of them where the higher up you go, the more efficiently you terraform planets. Another one, the higher up you go, the farther you can fly to get to new planets. You have a whole nother uh, concept in Gaia Project of Gaia forming. There are these purple planets which cannot actually be terraformed through regular means. You have to send this Gaia former token down and it is going to turn it into a green planet which is nice and it's different. And you can only do that if you progress up another one of the technology tracks. Uh, so I really enjoyed that aspect to the game. Like it was much more interesting than just trying to stay ahead of your opponents to have six more points or something like that. It's a much bigger deal to be like, okay, cool, I go to this point, I lock in four points, and now I can move faster, and moving faster is fun. So when it comes to the main board of this game, and what you're doing every single turn, is you're just turning resources into points in a variety of ways, uh, and one big way is through building buildings out onto the board, and then upgrading those buildings into better buildings, just like you did in Terra Mystica. And Every time you pull a building off the board, you have uncovered a uh, little income slot. Well, not every time, but most of the time. So that at the beginning of the next turn, you are going to generate more resources and then be able to do more stuff on your next turn. So it definitely has a um, escalation vibe with getting more uh, buildings out to have more resources at the beginning of every turn. And then there's also engine building with all of these little bonus tiles, which are not only going to bump you up the, the technology tracks, but also give you awesome abilities that uh, maybe are different from before. I guess they're not super different, but they might just be more income that you're going to be getting or maybe give you a new scoring condition so that when you do one thing, you're going to get extra points. And you get points for doing a ton of different things in this game. And I should probably stop talking about the specifics of it and say that I was enjoying pretty much every minute of this game and I came last, I think. Yes, I'm pretty sure I came last. I came last in my last game of Terra Mystica as well. And the third one. Yeah, okay, so I'm not doing great at these kind of games. <laughs> if you count Terra Mystica, Terra Mystica and Gaia Project, I've gone last in all of them. But I've enjoyed all of them, and specifically, I enjoyed Gaia Project so much more than Terra Mystica because of the streamlining of those tracks. There's also some changes that it does for the end game scoring. It's not just about having a big clump of buildings like in Terra Mystica. Instead, you have a new uh, variety of objects like uh, objectives. Uh, the, in the game that we played, we were trying to have a variety of different planets that we terraformed, and then just having the most buildings in a collective federation, which is just like towns in Terra Mystica. And again, I'm not going to go into any more specifics, but the stuff that we were doing, the decisions that we we're making, the strategic decisions that we were making were incredibly satisfying. And even though I came dead last, I still really enjoyed myself. I definitely walked away from the game thinking like, why did I do so poorly? But I had so much fun while I was doing so poorly that I think that speaks volumes for the game. I'm definitely looking forward to playing this one again. Um, Asmodee has told me that I'll be getting a review copy of this one. I'm not sure exactly when, and I am anxiously anticipating getting that copy in. I have lots of other games to play right now, but I am very much looking forward to getting another play in of Guy Project. At Game of Note number four, we have reached Noria, and this is another surprise for me. I was able to pick up a review copy of Noria while at Essen Spiel, and I figured it would probably be a little bit till I got to it. I tried to read the rules to it, and they seemed very dense, and I was expecting going into this game to see this really cool new mechanism of wheel building. Like, that's the thing that was really hyping up this game. Uh, sure, the art is beautiful, you like on floating cities on these rocks all in the sky, but the main thing that had everybody talking was you have these three-tiered wheels in front of you, essentially kind of like gears, and you spin them on your turn, and the number of the little uh, bonus tokens on them are going to dictate the actions you can take in your turn. That sounded really cool, and then I tried to read the rule book, and the first like three pages are about investments and how you have to make sure that you are investing in the right things because that's the only way you're going to get points. And I'm like, I don't care about investments. Tell me about the wheel. And I just, I just decided I was like going to get to it later. But I ended up uh, lending my game to a friend of mine, Dave, who was really interested in trying it. And I figured he could read the rules, he could learn the game, and he could teach it to me. And that is exactly what happened. I brought my copy to Board Game Geek Con, which is probably good considering it was very hard to uh, um, find a copy of Noria to play. And Dave was able to teach me the game. We played a four-player game of it, and I really, really enjoyed it. Like, it kind of blew me away. I, it's probably because my expectations were not high going into it. I was kind of expecting to be disappointed. I've heard some um, kind of middling things from other people online uh, who have experience with the game so far, but playing this game, I really enjoyed what I was doing because, well, first of all, we have these, um, these three wheels that you have in front of you. 
and you can spend resources to kind of get extra turns in so that you can control what action options you have available to you. But then the main thing of the game is that you are trying to bump up your little investment token up this track. But realistically, what it means is if you're going up the um, obsidian track, then at the end of the game, you want to make sure that you, uh, well, I mean, as you're playing the game, you want to make sure that you are getting a lot of obsidian to keep bumping yourself up that track because the position on the track is going to be multiplied by a scoring multiplier down below that track. And so you're going to want to spend these uh, gear resources, which you could normally use to move your token, your, um, your wheels around, you can spend those gears to lock in better and better score modifiers. So you want to spend those resources to make sure that Obsidian is worth more and more because you're going hard on Obsidian. But the thing is, maybe your opponents are not going hard on Obsidian, and when they bump up their own scoring um, modifiers, every time you bump one, you actually remove one from the board from the potential pool. So whenever anything gets locked in, it's permanent. Like, the value of that track cannot go down. But the ceiling for that track can go down because you can put up to four cubes in and if somebody removes one of those four cubes from the pool, now you have a maximum of three cubes that you can put down. And so there is this constant tension between um, trying to make sure you're going up these good tracks that are good for you, but then your opponents could also follow the efforts that you made of bumping up the scoring modifier on those tracks and then spending a bunch of resources and then going really high on those tracks themselves and getting points themselves. So the other things that you're doing in this game are just kind of general escalation engine building kind of things where you are gaining new little uh, airships and uh, of three different colors. And then when you like want to go harvest some mycelium, which is green, you look to the number of airships you have and then you get that much of the resource and then you can spend that in order to go up on tracks and do a variety of other things in the game. But it seemed like a tighter game than I was expecting. I guess looking at the rule book, looking at all the components, I thought it would be kind of broad and expansive, but you really are focused on specifically just trying to get the resources to go up those tracks. Some of the tracks are a little bit more complicated. The resources that you need, you need to actually spend basic resources to make these more advanced goods and then spend those goods to go up the tracks. But those tracks have much better scoring multipliers on them to kind of make up for the extra effort that you have to do. You also have this kind of um, cloud city uh, mechanism. You have all these different uh, tiles. And this is one place that you can go to get more of these airships, but you can also build factories that will allow you to build those more complex goods. And I will say that we played with the advanced variant, um, which means at the start of the game, you just put these cloud um, tiles down in a circle and you just kind of walk back and forth along the circle, um, always moving to one adjacent spot and then paying penalties if there are opponents there. But the base way you're supposed to play the game is you're supposed to have a face down stack, flip over the top one, and then go there, or you can move from any one to any other one, which is much looser. And I will play the game with that to kind of get some experience with it, but I can see where Dave was coming from. He said he thought that the advanced variant was more satisfying, and I think I agree with him. So yeah, Noria it impressed me. It was certainly more fun than I was expecting going in, and many of us who have who played it at Board Game Geekon have mentioned subsequently that like, man, I'm really looking forward to trying Noria again. It was a cool experience, and yeah, I liked it. Coming in at game number five, we have the Master's Trials Wrath of Magmaroth, and this is essentially Dice City, the cooperative game. And I went into Board Game Geekon wanting to try this, but I did not expect to like it as much as I ended up uh, liking it. Uh, I own Dice City, and if you're not familiar with Dice City, the um, main central mechanism for um, the Master's Trials and Dice City are the same. The way it works is you have this board in front of you. It has five different rows and then six columns. And the five rows are color coordinated to these five dice. And the six columns are number coordinated to the six pips on the die. So that means your board is essentially showing you the face of all the dice. If you roll the white die, you put it onto the spot that matches the pip values on that white line. And on your turn, you can evaluate the spot underneath it. And as you're playing both Dice Cities and the Master's Trials, you are going to be upgrading this board. You're going to be putting new cards down, which means when you roll that specific die face, you now get to do a better ability. You are essentially doing dice customization without having to actually snap off faces on your die and put new ones on. It also lets you do more complicated actions with these die faces. And I enjoy Dice City, but it is a co uh, competitive game. You are getting a bunch of resources. You can turn those resources into points or just more cards to put on your board, roll the dice, and, you know, there is definitely skill there, but you also want to get lucky and have the dice land on the spot you want. The reason the Master's Trials um, appealed to me so much is because I enjoyed the mechanism of Dice City, but I felt like in a competitive scenario, it was easy to get kind of bummed out if you just had really bad luck. You keep rolling your dice, you keep not missing your, uh, not hitting the upgrades that you've done, and you could feel like, well, I lost because I rolled poorly. But in a cooperative scenario, 
if you have bad luck, well, it's kind of shared around the entire group and you are all trying to collectively do this thing together. And I felt like it would work better and it absolutely does. Um, so there is a thing you could do in both of these games where if a die is on a spot that you don't like, you can remove another one of your five dice, not evaluate its action at all, and then move one of your previously rolled dice to an adjacent spot. This gives you extra control over your board and it, it gives you some smart uh, things to think about as far as where you're gonna be putting these upgrades down. But in the Master's Trials, you can now remove a die from your board to look across the table and say, hey Claire, you now get a movement. You can move one of your dice. So you are constantly now talking. Instead of a Dice City where there was a lot of silence as people were just APing, trying to convert the resources, what are they gonna do? And you can think a little bit about what you're gonna do on your turn in Dice City, but it definitely, I didn't like the downtime in that game. But in the Master's Trials, we were just constantly talking like, can anybody give, give me some help? Um, can uh, somebody have any free moves? Uh, do we have enough insight to do this thing, to do that thing? Because you are trying to defeat the um, this big bad guy named Magmaroth. I guess he's like a lava monster, very generic in general. And you have nine turns to nine turns to gear yourself up to the point where you will then fight Magmaroth and try to kill him. But every single one of those turns, you're gonna have all these lava minions that come out and damage you. And when they damage you, you put little damage tokens down on your board. And if you put your die on that spot, you cannot evaluate that spot until it gets healed. And a really cool thing about Master's Trials is that it is asymmetric. So you have like an Avenger who does lots of damage. You have a Mystic who makes lots of mana. You have a Warden who is able to heal themselves and their uh, companions very well. And you actually mix and match the boards. You have a main board for the characters I just said. Then you have a school of, um, I don't know, fighting that you are that goes into the middle. And then you have a weapon that goes down to the bottom. And the top two boards have 10 special cards each. The bottom one has five. You kind of shuffle all these up and then you take the 10, 10, and five, shuffle those cards up, and now it's your customized deck of action upgradable options. So hypothetically, this is gonna help the replayability of the game. Uh, I did play it twice at BGGCon and it did seem like the most powerful cards in that deck were the ones that were aligned with your main uh, role, like if you're the Mystic or the Warden. So I am maybe a little concerned that you might end up kind of playing the same game over and over again. If you are the Warden, you're just gonna keep healing people every single time and you're gonna kind of come up with a combo between these cards and keep evaluating that combo. But I cannot authoritatively say that because I haven't analyzed all of the other cards and how, you know, okay, well, if they swap out this school with that school, now they have a new option that might bounce off of it. I do think there is gonna be some variety there. And I enjoyed all of the discussions going on here. I feel like the Master's Trials did a good job of combating the number one issue of cooperative games, and that is the um, quarterbacking syndrome, where one person tells everybody else what to do. And there are a couple ways to combat this, and the way uh, Master's Trials does it is just information overload. Like you have so many options in front of you. You've custom built this uh, selection of actions for your dice, the person across the table, they have no idea what I'm doing. They maybe have like a rough idea that like every now and then I do a really cool turn, but they can't tell me what to do. I can't tell them what to do because I'm focused on what I'm doing. And instead we can collaborate and say like, okay, how much damage are we doing this turn? Or does anybody have a free stun available? And you are, and that collaboration is what cooperative games are all about. It's not about telling people what to do. It's about figuring out where we're at, like how we roll, like I rolled really poorly this turn or I rolled really great and what those options provide for me and also for my opponents. I'm like, you know what, don't worry about stunning those guys. I rolled a lot of um, the win, so I'll stun them this turn. You can, you can focus on doing this other thing. And I really enjoyed that experience. I mean, we played it twice for a reason, and I think all four of us have agreed that we would like to play it again. Uh, I'd like to see more of what's going on in here. And the last thing I should mention is that they're um, the big bad guy at the end of the game. He starts the game off with 10 health, which is not much, but then you put a huge array of these seal cards in front of them. And each one of these seals will buff up the boss when you get to them. It might increase their health by 15. It might mean that they attack for five more. It might mean you cannot actually damage the boss until you kill all of the minions. And each one of these seals has a bunch of mana cost on them. So while you are spending your mana in order to upgrade your dice in front of you, you also need to be thinking about spending mana to go ahead and break these seals so that when you finally get to the boss, it's not impossible. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that if you break no seals and you get to the final boss, there's just no way that you can win. You have to prioritize your resources accordingly. And this game was really hard. Like, we had no chance in the first game. We got to the final boss and we didn't even evaluate it. We're like, yeah, we're just, we didn't break a single seal. There's no point in doing this. In the second game, we were able to break like four or so seals, but um, we were still wiped. I think there was a chance we could have won if we had had one more turn. So it felt a lot closer. But I do feel like 
I feel like this game could have been balanced a little bit easier so that that first play you maybe have like a 70% chance of winning as opposed to what feels like a 95% chance of losing. <laughs> uh, and I guess that does incentivize you to like want to play better, but I don't want it to be the point where you have to play perfectly and you have to do exactly this every single time in order to win it. Now, supposedly the designer has said that if you play it on hard mode and you're really good, like they are consistently beating the game on hard mode. And you know, I believe them, I'm gonna assume they're not lying, but that first game we played was on normal, the second game was on easy, and we still wiped even though we are all good at board games. So either way, we're intrigued to try this one more. I feel like it might be a little bit too difficult, but it's got some really great stuff going on here, and I really enjoyed that Dice City mechanism in a cooperative environment. Let's now move on to game number six, which is Riverboat, and this is another game that I was not really expecting to play at BGGCon. It is one of the many games that was, were designed by Michael Kiesling that were released over this last year. It was a big year for Michael Kiesling. And I tried to read the rules to this one. Actually, I read the rules to this one on the way to Spiel, and I was pretty turned off by them because it seemed like it just had way too much stuff going on. Like in this game, you have these multiple phases, I think five different phases for every turn of the game. And you're gonna play, I think, four or five uh, turns to the game, something like that. And each phase is completely different. It's essentially like play phase one, which is its own game, play phase two, which is its own game. And that seemed kind of convoluted and I just kind of ignored it. But then my friends, Matt, Claire, and Hung all got a copy of it and played it while we were playing something else and they really liked it. And so I was like, well, you guys know the game. It is here. This is a good opportunity to try it. And I'm really glad we did because the game actually really works well together. It's definitely a mid-weight Euro game. I don't think it's that heavy. Uh, it took us over 90 minutes to play it, but again, it was a first time playing. But everything that you're doing in this game kind of worked out much better than I expected. So what's happening is you have a plantation field in front of you. You're, I guess, in the uh, south of the United States. And in the first phase, you are gonna do this kind of uh, kingdom builder type thing where you have a stack of cards, you draw the top card, and it might say, okay, great. And that means you now have a pile of these little field workers and you have to put them down, put one of them down onto a gray location on your board. And your board is different than each one of your opponents. So you then place the thing down and you draw the next card, place a new one down, draw the third card, and you're gonna do this up to eight times. And now you have up to eight of these people in front of you. If you've run out of people, then you can do this less. And that does happen near the end of the game. But you're trying to kind of make little patterns with the uh, clumping up of these different workers because then you go to phase two, which is gonna be a drafting phase where you pull these tiles from the middle of the table and they have various types of uh, plants on them like pumpkins or radishes or um, grain and that kind of stuff. And if you take, for instance, the one that is three hexagons nestled next to each other and you have three workers who are in that pattern, you can put that tile down onto your board and then they are essentially going to be harvesting those goods for you in a later turn of the game. So the first phase is about putting workers down and trying to get good patterns. The second phase is trying to evaluate those patterns, but get the right ones for you, trying to take good things away from your opponents, and that pool is gonna dry up and then refill at the end of the round. And then you get to the third phase, which is the riverboat phase. And this one, you are going to actually pull your workers up off of the fields, which um, accounts for actually harvesting those resources and sending them out onto riverboats that are gonna go down the Mississippi River. And these riverboats will give you little bonuses and kind of line them up along the top of your board. Um, they give you um, one-shot bonuses and potentially points at the end of the game. And then you go into another phase where you'll be doing some scoring based off of the number of your workers that you have removed from your pool and put up on your porch. I'm not really sure what the um, thematic explanation of that one is, but you get points for them uh, every single round. And then you can also... Uh, evaluate these little green workers, which will give you victory points for different conditional based things. And I probably talked about the specifics a little bit too much, but you should you should now understand that how this game works in phases. You like place workers down, then you put the goods down, and then you harvest the goods, and then you do it all over again. And it worked really well. I super enjoyed it. And I did win, and I do think that might be part of it, I suppose. I didn't think I was winning. Um, Claire was on a tear at BGGCon this year. She won a ton of games, and it looked like she was in a very dominant position, but I was able to do a really big scoring at the end of the game with my riverboats because you have this little captain dude that you're kind of walking down the gangplank and the person who gets the farthest down the gangplank is gonna score points for all of the boats that they passed. And then everybody else is only gonna score half of the points for every boat that their person has passed. So I went really hard on this, um, this track. I got up to the top and I scored like 23 points off of it whereas my opponents were only getting like eight, nine kind of points and that was definitely a big part of me winning. But 
Either way, it was a neat game. It was uh, fascinating how all these things work together. It definitely felt like, I wouldn't say it's elegant. Like each phase kind of had an elegance to it. But when it all crammed together, there's a lot of stuff going on here. But it was more than I would normal, normally expect for a medium weight Euro. But it did play in a reasonable time frame. And I'd like to try this one again. I think it was fun. Okay, we've now reached game number seven, and I think it's finally time for us to start talking about some lighter games. <laughs> I definitely enjoyed all of these Euros that I've already talked about. It was definitely a great con for Euros, but at game number seven, I have Iquazu, which is a new game from Haba, and it's definitely on the far, far uh, light end of the spectrum. And the first big thing about this game that catches your eye is the game board itself. Like, it has this gimmick going on where you have this big, colorful board with this large waterfall, and then you are going to cover um, on top of a large part of the waterfall all these little water slats, and then there's going to be a window with, well, you could just look at the photo. <laughs> and you can see that there are all of these li the little colored spots available to you. And on your turn, you have a hand of cards. Your uh, hand will consist of cards that either have a single uh, white icon, a single orange icon, or a single blue icon. And on your turn, you either draw four cards, and that's it, your turn is over, or you spend a set of cards, and you put one of your little gem tokens down onto a matching spot on the board. Now, you need to spend one card per column that you are out from the uh, left-hand side of that window. And as the game plays, that window is going to keep moving and moving and moving down the board, unlocking new spots. So that means if you spend four cards right now, you can go to the fourth column, and then that gem is going to stay there for four full rounds until it finally gets wiped out versus spending a single card puts the gem in the first column, and it's only going to last until a scoring happens, which is when that full, that column gets full. And then you just have a little bit of, you know, who did the best? Like, you look at the number of the gems in that column, you look down underneath, you'll see a little number on the board, you score the, that number of points if you did the most, uh, the secondary if you did second uh, uh, best, and then a really cool catch to this game, because so far it's like, okay, whatever. But a really neat thing is you then score every one of the rows. And on the end of the rows are these little bonus tokens. And you are going to flip over these bonus tokens every time you slide the little uh, iguana guy farther down the waterfall, so you're not really sure what it's going to be each time. But again, you count up the number of gems on that row. Whoever has the most takes that bonus. It might be more cards, so they draw those um, when they want to, and that means they don't have to spend an entire turn drawing up those cards. It might just be victory points. It also could be um, letting you make a set of cards that you put down be wild. And so it's just really nice, like scoring the main thing and then scoring every one of these rows, giving bonuses out to everybody, moving the little frame down, kind of shifting the little panel over, and then playing again. And you're going to keep going until you do like 10 or 11 of these scorings. And I played this twice and really enjoyed both of the plays. I felt like this is an incredibly elegant game. I taught it in like a minute the second time I played it to my friend Matt. Um, obviously, it's easier and quicker to teach it when it is in front of you, um, but it's just such a simple structure, and the decisions, I really enjoyed them. I did very well in that second game. I think I came in third in the first game, and I walloped in the second game. I, I came in first by a rather large margin, but that's because I think I played very well. Uh, but I will say that that second game was a three-player, and the first game was four. I do think this game is probably better at four, because in that second game, we kind of had the three-player syndrome where my two opponents were kind of beating each other up, trying to take majorities, and I just kind of did other things around them, and I did very well for that. So this is probably best at four, but it was really captivating, and I just enjoyed what I was doing while I was playing it. I'd honestly love to have a copy of this one. It does not appear to be out yet. I've already done some research, but this is one that I am hoping to see in my collection. I'm hoping to get um, a few more plays in because it's just so simple to get out. It was like 30 or 40 minutes to play, like 40 on the high end if people are really doing some AP there. It was just way more enjoyable than I was maybe expecting because I thought it was just going to be a gimmick. But the actual game there adds to this beautiful gimmick to make a really cool package. Game number eight is Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. Now, this is also a light game, and it's also the first of many uh, colon the dice game or the card game games that I'll be talking about later on in this video. But if you're not familiar with the Castles of Burgundy, it is the classic quintessential uh, Feld game. Like, uh, Stefan Feld uh, made this game. There's point salad. You get points for doing all sorts of things. It's like a 90 or so euro -y experience. Lots of people love it. I think it's fine. I think it's a good game. It's not my favorite one of his. But I was intrigued to try out the dice game version because it is a roll and write style game, which means that you roll dice um, and then everybody simultaneously gets to write down on a pad of paper 
some stuff down, like based off of the conditions of how the dice went to try and score the most points. And I'm not really going to go into the specifics of how it plays. What I will tell you is that it is a very good distillation and dice abstraction of the actual game of Castles of Burgundy. Like when you are teaching the dice game, you say, well, you know, once you complete this region, you get to score the points for this according to that. And if you play Castles of Burgundy, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. You also get bonuses when you complete regions in the main game of Castles of Burgundy. You also have little bonuses like workers that let you change the value of your dice. Well, that's what workers did in the actual Castles of Burgundy game. Um, there are little races to complete a full region of uh, specific colors on your area. Again, that was in the main game. And I just really enjoyed all these correlations. But at the same time, I enjoyed this for what it was, which is a really solid roll and write game. Like probably one of the better uh, thinky roll and write style games. Like many of them, like Quix and even Quinto, like they're very rules light and you just, you're doing some stuff and you're thinking and you're having fun. But with this one, it might actually be my favorite thinky roll and write at the moment because you are, you're doing some resource conversion, scratching out uh, things on your pad. You're like gaining new um, uh, bonuses. You like circle them on the pad and then you have that in your mind. You scratch it out later when you use it. You're trying to make all these combos work as you're kind of expanding out on the, this uh, grid of little hexes in front of you on the pad. And I really enjoyed it. I think my biggest complaint to the game is that it's so tiny, like the pad of paper is like that big and it exactly fits in this tiny little box. And I feel like I wouldn't mind owning this game, but if I did, I would probably want to laminate the the, um, the sheets and actually blow them up, like make them be at least 50% bigger because when you have a dry erase marker, you have to like really cram that into the different areas. And I feel like it wouldn't fit on these tiny little boxes that work okay if you have a pencil, but not with a dry erase. So yeah, either way, um, I thought I was gonna enjoy this one, but we ended up playing it twice. I really enjoyed this one. I would not mind playing this one again. Okay, next up we have Yamatai, which is not a new game. This came out uh, earlier this year, I'm pretty sure, and it is um, kind of a sequel-ish to Five Tribes. I know I said that and people are like, no, like yelling at their screen. And I know that it is not very similar to Five Tribes, but it's uh, the same designer, same art style, and it has some of the similar vibes to it. And I'll tell you right now that I really dislike Five Tribes and I quite like Yamatai. Like the a lot of the things that I heard about Yamatai when it first came out were not amazing. Like there was a lot of lukewarm reviews that came out from people that I respect. And so I kind of just avoided it because of that. I was like, well, I don't like Five Tribes. This is even remotely similar to Five Tribes. That's not going to help. And then people aren't liking it, whatever. I'll just ignore it. But then on like the third day of BGGCon, my friend Matt checked it out at the library. He's like, you know what? Let's give this one a try. And I was in a really good spot for it. So we played a three-player game of it. And I really enjoyed it. It was a really good experience because what you're doing in this game kind of similar to Five Tribes is you are trying to analyze a communal set of resources in the middle of the table and trying to do it to your best benefit. But in Five Tribes, you have this analysis paralysis hell spiral of doing a little Mancala thing of like plunking down little dudes on the map. But in Yamatai, you are simply placing these little ships around the perimeter of all these little islands on the board. And then you want to try and build buildings which require certain combinations of colored ships around these given islands. And so that worked out really well, but the really, the, the nice things, like the things that really got me, I was like, yeah, this is cool. Like, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Mostly had to do with the uh, turn order mechanism. You have all of these tokens and you, they have different numbers on them. And if you take a token, you will get to maybe generate some ships that you could put out on the board, maybe have a special ability. And then at the end of the round, you look at all the numbers on the bottom of the tokens that were taken, and those will dictate the player order for the next round. And then you'll take all those tokens, flip them upside down, put them at the end of the line, shuffle some new ones down, flip them over, and now you have a new variety of actions that you can do on your turn. And I just liked how it all fit together. Like we were um, constantly talking throughout the whole game. It really seemed like we were jockeying back and forth. Matt went really hard on these kind of advisor cards, which are a lot like the, the genie gin cards in uh, Five Tribes. They give you points right now usually, and then also some kind of game breaking abilities. And Matt had a really good combo going with just getting all these tokens and getting more of those. Um, and at the very end of the game, it was pretty close, but Claire was able to squeak out a win. I, I thought I was gonna win it. I was honestly one boat shy of ending the game one round earlier. And we did the math and decided that I think I would have actually won in that case. So it was a very close game. It's a beautiful game. I would not mind playing this one again. It was pretty simple. It really seemed to kind of flow in a really nice, decent pace. The rules seemed kind of obvious. Like it, it was taught to me and I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's go ahead and give it a shot. And I would not mind playing this one again. I don't think it's high enough on this list uh, for me to be like, yeah, I want to go out and buy that game. 
specifically because it would be competing with a lot of other midweight Euros that I probably do actually enjoy more than it, but I would gladly sit down and play this one again if I was given the opportunity. Next up, we have number 10, and this one is Istanbul, the dice game, or a Das Wurfelspiel, if you're actually looking at the box that we played. And this one is a dice version of the game Istanbul, which I believe won the Kenner Spiel a few years ago. And I played once, and I did not like all that much. And the original Istanbul, you're kind of moving um, your kind of workers around the board, kind of snaking and leaving these little uh, uh, tokens back, and they had to kind of go back and take the tokens. And what you're doing in Istanbul and the dice game is you're racing towards getting these rubies. It's a race game. The first person to get a certain number of them is going to win the game. And you are doing some kind of like coin conversions, some resource conversions in both these games. But the dice game is a much lighter affair. And I read the rules to this one on the way to Spiel because I was intrigued by it. And after I read the rules, I was like, oh, this looks kind of uninteresting. Like roll the dice and then get the stuff on the dice. And then you just, ah, it, it didn't seem like it had anything new. Like there was no real catch. And so I decided not to get a copy of it. But then I was at Board Game Geek Con. I saw it in the library. I knew I'd read the rules already. And I was like, why not? Let's give it a try. And I was really pleasantly surprised. I actually really enjoyed this play because it does a lot of small, subtle things that work really well together to make what felt to me to be a somewhat fresh experience. Because um, when you take your typical The Dice game, especially um, a Yahtzee-esque kind of game where you roll the dice and then you can potentially do some re-rolls, in most of these games, you get a certain number of re-rolls. Like, it's a very common thing to be like, roll the dice, you can lock out some dice and then re-roll up to two times, that kind of thing. But in Istanbul, the dice game, you get no free rerolls. You roll the dice and that's what you got. You have to do something with that. And from a design perspective, that means they were able to work off of that and make sure that you never had bad turns, first of all. And so that means there is a ton of stuff that you could do with these dice. There's a little uh, player cheat sheet that has like eight or nine different things that you can do. So there's pretty much always going to be something somewhat decent that you can do. Like the worst case scenario is that you take a little wild resource that you can then spend on a future turn. Um, but another really cool thing that's going on in this game is that you can get these little mosque tiles, which are ongoing income benefit. So you are building a little bit of an engine, a little escalating kind of thing as you're playing it. Like, you know, I take this thing and now I generate one crystal every turn. What do crystals do? they give you rerolls. So you spend a crystal to reroll as many dice as you want to, and suddenly now you've kind of unlocked the ability to have rerolls. It's a special thing. Like if you don't have any of these crystals, you're not gonna be rerolling the dice and you have to stick with what you have. And I really enjoyed the process of like building out all of these little action tiles. Like I felt like I was kind of building a custom thing for me. Every time it was my turn, I was excited because I got to take all these resources, roll the dice and see what I was gonna do with it. It just seemed to work. I'm not gonna sit here and say, this game is amazing. It's like, you know, revolutionizes dice games or anything like that. But I will say that this is a very straightforward, super easy to teach, great example of a well done dice game that I would not mind playing again. I was close to winning this one. I think I ended up losing this one too. Uh, I was close to winning it, but um, I ended up losing to Chow Yu. In fact, I think everyone, it was a four player game. I think all four of us got to our fifth and final um, Ruby on that last turn of the game. And then it came down to a money tiebreaker and Chow Yu had so much money. So either way, everyone around the table seemed to be enjoying it. Like this is the kind of game you have to go into it the expectation of you might roll dice and not be able to do the thing you wanted to do, but you have to try and adapt your plans to the dice that you roll and um, play accordingly. And I really enjoyed it. It was fun. I might actually look into getting a copy of this one. Like it's, it's so light. It's so easy to get out. Like I could teach this to pretty much anybody. And I just had a smile on my face, like the whole game. Yeah, I think this one might actually show up in my collection at some point. Alrighty, we've now reached game number 11, which means we're halfway through the list. And this one is Topiary. So I didn't know anything about this game until I went to uh, Spiel. Um, right before I actually attended the con, it was announced that Renegade Games had picked up the license for Topiary to um, distribute it in the United States. I think it's going to be releasing at some point early in 2018. And I was like, okay, cool, well, whatever. And then I was talking to my friend uh, Tiffany, who um, uh, the one tar and is her YouTube channel. And she was super excited to play this game. Uh, she got a copy of it at Spiel and I didn't end up getting a chance to play it. So I just kind of logged that back in my head. Like maybe there's something to this. Maybe I should check it out at some point. And then like three days into BGG Con, it was right there on the library shelf. We decided why not? We grabbed the game. Uh, Matt read the rules and like, five minutes <laughs> and we went ahead and played it and we all really enjoyed it. It's a spatial abstract puzzly kind of game where you are gonna make this grid. I think it was a five by five of these little tiles. You put all of them face down except for the one in the middle and you flip that one over and on every tile in the game, you have a, 
a a shrub, you know, like a bush that has been kind of chopped up to look like a specific thing, like a T-Rex or like um, a spherical hexagon or a pyramid and that kind of thing. And then everybody has a hand of these tiles. And on your turn, all you do is take one of your little um, guests and you put them out onto the board and they're going to go on the perimeter because the goal of this game is you want your guests to have the most beautiful time, like the, the best time in this garden full of funnily cut uh, bushes. <laughs> and you put a um, one of your guests down and they're either going to go in a row or a column or you could put them down kind of looking at a diagonal, which is definitely an interesting take I didn't expect. And then you have to take one of the face down tiles in the area that that guest is looking for and you swap it for a tile that you have in your hand that you, put that, you then put down face up. And the last crux of the game is that a guest can only see a um, piece of shrubbery if it is taller than everything else in front of it. And the um, height comes into play with the numbers. They go from one to four. And that's the game. You're going to do five turns. That's it. You have five of these little people. You go around the table. There's going to be 20 um, actions total, I guess, for our four-player game. And it got really tight. Like, the decisions were great, honestly. And it was um, rather mean also, you know, because you are putting these people down they're kind of looking out there and you're like, okay, I got like, you know, a uh, two and a three and a four. That's great. But you are also have this one space right in front of the person that you haven't covered in yet. And now your opponent comes in, they go over here, they're looking down this way and they slap a five down. Well, suddenly there's a five in front of you, one, two, three, four. You just lost points. <laughs> you uh, at the end of the game, you just add up all the numbers that a person can see, and those are the points you have available to you. And so at the beginning of the game, it's it's nice. Like the first two turns, it's like I'll go here, I'll go there. Ah, oh, this is nice. It's happy. By the time you get to that third game, you're starting to do a tile that might make someone groan across the table. In that final round, it was like you couldn't do anything without <laughs> getting it in somebody else's way. And we just enjoyed it. It was less than 30 minutes because, again, you only take five turns of the game. But they were five satisfying turns. We all liked what we um, saw in this game. I would not mind playing this one again. I'm not sure if it's, like, collection-worthy for me at this point because, I don't know, it's an abstract game. It is quite quick. I mean, to a certain extent, having quick, solid, filler-style games is a nice thing to have in the collection. I guess it wouldn't surprise me if um, at some point this one made it around. But either way, I definitely recommend it. It was a fun one, and I would not mind playing it again. At game number 12, we have yet another one of these new modified versions of old games. In this case, it is Karuba the Card Game. And this is one that, honestly, I was planning on picking up at Spiel. It was on my list. I was like, yeah, it's probably cheap. I, I may as well do it because I really enjoy Karuba. And I just kind of forgot about it. I never got around to actually picking up a copy. So we ended up playing this one twice at Board Game Geek Con. Uh, the second time because we really enjoyed the first play. Uh, in this one, it is a really good card game version of a previous game, because if you're not familiar with Karuba, it is the kind of game where one person has a shoveled up stack of tiles. They draw the top tile, and they tell everybody else to pick that same exact tile, and then they put it down in front of themselves. So it's a tile laying game where you're trying to work your, um, your explorers through a forest to try and get to these temples. In the card game, it's different. Like, it's definitely similar. Like, like a good card or dice game version of a previous game should be, it has the vibe of the previous game, but does something new. And this one, everybody shuffles up this deck of, I believe, 16 cards. And then they're going to draw three cards, and they're going to play from them. So right from the get-go, people are not all playing the same card, which is a big divergence from the original Karuba. But in a uh, similarity uh, to the original game, you are trying to get your explorers over to these temples. But the thing is that the cards themselves have explorers on them. They have temples on them. They have golds and uh, nuggets and crystals, which are also worth points. And the catch of this game, it plays two to six players. The catch of the game is you have three cards in your hand. You have to pick two of them. You then sum the number values on those two cards. You all simultaneously pick and then you reveal. And the person whose sum is the lowest needs to discard one of those two cards and they will never have access to it again for the rest of the game. And now everybody plays all the cards they have in front of them. So that means that person only plays a single card in front of them. Everybody else gets to place two cards and you're gonna do that, I think, eight times. And that is gonna be the game. And so you have this tension of like, how low do you go without being too low because you certainly don't wanna lose these things because the lower value cards in general seem to connect much better. And just like the original Karuba, your explorers will block each other in trying to get to the temple. So you're trying to put these cards down in such a way to have an unbroken path from like the blue explorer to the blue temple, the orange explorer to the orange temple. And if they happen to cross over some gold nuggets and some crystals, those are gonna generate points for them as well. You're not allowed to big build a bigger than uh, four by four grid in front of you. And the game plays in like, 20 or so minutes, and I really enjoyed it. Like, the decisions I was making were good. I think I won the first... No, no, I, I didn't win the first game. I did it pretty well. I came in second. 
In the second game, it was four players and I came dead last because it was my fault. I just went way too conservatively. I didn't take advantage of those crystals and those gold nuggets and I was just blown out of the water, but I felt like I lost because I made bad decisions. I also do think that in the early game, I drew a lot of low cards and so I was the person to lose a card a couple times when I maybe wouldn't have liked to, but also at the end of the day, this is a filler style game that plays in like 20 or so minutes and I enjoyed it. This one was cool. I would not mind having this one around in my collection, I don't think. Um, part of me wonders if I would actually play Karuba if I had Karuba the card game in my collection. I mean, honestly, I haven't played Karuba in over a year at this point just because there's so many games to play. I still think that Karuba is an excellent game, but for right now, the card game actually felt a little bit like a deeper experience, uh, even though it is very light. And I enjoyed the stuff I was doing, and yeah, I, I'd like to play this one again. I think maybe at six players, that would be uh, even better, just because if you have a bum luck draw hand, odds are good somebody else does, and maybe their draw is worse than you, or they make decisions accordingly. So either way, that wraps up that one. Let's now roll on to game number 13, which is Roulette. <laughs> this is a game that was in the Dexterity Alley, which is this really great spot at Board Game Geekon that is between uh, one of the exhibitor halls, it's between the library, and it's also um, next to the main board gaming um, ballroom. And that means you're just kind of walking through and you can just stop and play some silly uh, dexterity games. And um, the four of us, um, Matt Claire, myself, and Jessica, we were about to go to bed, actually. And we were kind of walked by and we're like, Let's give this a quick shot. And we ended up playing uh, two of the games of it back to back. And we really enjoyed it. It was so much fun. Like, we've actually been contemplating, like, is this worth, like, picking up? Like, it was just silly because you have these um, little ramps in front of you. Each player has a ramp. And it's a two versus two game. And the ramp has a little slot. And you put a ball at the top of the ramp and you let go. And it launches the ball out onto the main playing space. And it's a little metal ball that you're trying to hit a large wooden ball. And you're just trying to knock that wooden ball into the goal of your opponents. It was frenetic, it was ridiculous, and it was so much fun. We're just like constantly just like shoving these balls in, like shooting the big one back and forth, and it's like flying all over the place, and sometimes it makes a perfect goal. It was silly, it was fun. I would not mind playing this one again. We never came back to it, but I think it's just kind of, there were so many other things going on. It was just a ridiculously fun time. It seemed like what that original game Crossfire from the 80s was supposed to be. Like, you know, I'm a child of the 80s. I remember that, you know, Crossfire kind of thing going on, and I was like, oh, this this is what that game was supposed to be. And I think that it has a little bubble level to try and keep the game board perfectly level. And we tried to modify it such that it would be. At the same time, it really felt like one side was way easier to score than the other side. But we, our data set was only two and it was the end of the night and we just had silly fun with it. So yeah, that's Roulette. I think it's actually just been re-released as Bonk. Um, but either way, I think I saw a copy of it at Target. Um, it's a rather big box, which is kind of a det deterrent for you know getting a copy of it um, at someplace like my house, but I do think they have a copy of it at Victory Point Cafe. Like this is a very good board game cafe game. We enjoyed it, it was silly, and it was fun. At game number 14, we now have Codenames Duet. This is the two player fully cooperative version of Codenames. And if I'm being honest, the reason it's so far down this list is probably because we were in a very hectic situation when uh, Jessica and I ended up playing this one. Uh, we both really enjoyed it, but it was like, we're kind of like squeeze it in, we're trying to, um, uh, finish off a game quickly before going rushing off to something else. So like our gaming experience for this one had it a little bit lower, but I think the game was really quite satisfying. I'm looking forward to trying this one more because um, as opposed to regular code names, which is team based and you have a code giver and then you have a bunch of people who are just trying to crack that code. In this case, you are both giving codes to your uh, companion across the table and they are going to be giving codes back to you. You have a double-sided um, little code sheet, which is going to tell you which one of the cards in the middle is going to be the ones you want to hit. I mean, if you're not familiar with code names, which is unlikely, but the, the basic idea is you need to give one word clues and then you give a certain number and that's the number of the different cards in the middle of the table that apply to the clue that you have and you're trying to guess what the person was trying to figure out. And in Codenames Duet, it's just a race against the clock to try and get these out in time. I think we decided our first game, did we play two games? I don't really remember. It was so chaotic when we were trying to play this one. But um, in the uh, in one of the games that we definitely finished, we uh, we thought we lost. But then we were, as we were walking away to return it to the library, we, we realized, wait, no, if we'd done this slightly differently, we, we should have won. Like, we should have done that. If we'd been thinking, we would have won. It was in the bag. But either way, it was a, a fun experience. It was a neat way to play code names. And honestly, I feel like I might want to try this one at four players. You know, it's technically duet, like a two-player experience, but you could easily have two people on one side and two people, two people on the other. And then you could discuss back and forth with the person right next to you about the clues because it still has that thing where you're like, 
I can't come up with anything, which is a problem with the original code names. But in this case, at least while you're doing that, your uh, companion is also trying to come up with a clue and they're not just staring at you, waiting for you to come up with a clue. So having a partner would be fun, although you have to like kind of whisper under your breath back and forth to try and see what you're gonna do. But um, uh, my friends Matt and Claire, they picked up a copy of it because they did the uh, premium badge thing for BGGCon this year. So there is a copy now in our greater friend group and I would like to play this one um, more. Uh, I think it's likely that, I think I'm more interested in playing this one than original code names, even though of course the original code names is still great for a group of like eight or so people and I certainly would not want to play a code names duet at that level. At game number 15, we now have Doggy Bag and I'm pretty sure this one was played because of the name. <laughs> it's a ridiculous name, right? I mean, doggy bags are what you put excess food into when you leave a restaurant to eat later. And here you have this like colorful, great artwork on the outside of the box. You have all these dogs and it's a bone hustling, push your luck style game that was a little more compelling than I expected going into it. Um, I had not heard about this one at all. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, one of my friends saw it in the library, they picked it out. I walked over to the table while the rules were being read and I was able to sit down and play it. And well, there is a bag. The game has to have a bag. It's called doggy bag. And inside of it, there is a variety of these different colored bones. There are five different colored bones in the game. And what you're doing on your turn is um, you're going around the table, drafting out these little bedding tiles. And the tile might have um, an, an ability like peek into the bag or like add a bone or two into the bag from your personal hidden supply. And then it'll have a number on it. Like if it has the number four, then that means that you are betting that you can pull four bones out of the bag without pulling any black bones out. And once everybody drafts all of these tokens, you then start with the person who took the boldest bet, which could be seven or even eight, nine, or 10, if it gets really crazy at the end of the game. And they just start pulling bones out. And if they pull out seven and they hit no black bones, then that's it. They get to keep all of their bones. The bones are worth like one, two, or three points. And nobody else gets to pull things out of the bag. But if they bust, if they hit a black bone, then all of those bones they pulled go into the center of the board, except for the gray ones. It's kind of like a consolation prize. If you pull a gray bone out, it's worth one point, and you get to keep it. But you also take that black bone, and your turn is over, and now it goes to the next person down on the list. So that drafting phase is pretty interesting. Like, you want to go higher up, because if you go really conservatively and take, like, the two tile... Odds are relatively good you're not gonna actually pull anything out of the bag because somebody else is going to be successful in pulling bones out without hitting a black bone before it gets around to you. And this was a silly game. Like it was definitely push your luck. Like it's one of those ones where, uh, well, first of all, there's player elimination. If you take your third black bone, you're out of the game. There is a uh, token you can grab to remove black bones, but the game was relatively quick and it definitely has that push your luck thing where like if you push your luck and you fail, well, now you are behind. So you have to push your luck even more and hope to get lucky to jump back in it. Oh, you failed again. Okay, well, now you need a humongous stroke of luck to get back into the game. And uh, Matt and I both failed out. Like, we, we uh, pushed our luck a little bit too hard. But at the very end of the game, um, uh, Claire, Nathan, and Jessica, were, they were all still in it. And there was a pretty exceptional final turn. Uh, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I think um, Claire took a big risk and it actually put her ahead of Nathan. Nathan had just gotten exceptional luck all game long with this huge pile of points in front of them. I don't think he ever hit a black bone, but then Claire had this huge turn and then Jessica managed to have an even bigger turn. Or I guess Claire had a big second to last turn and then Jessica pulled it out at the very end, had this humongous turn, didn't quite make it. I think Claire ended up winning by a point or two. It actually was surprisingly close and we all kind of wrapped up the game. And we're like, that was fun. That was silly. I would play it again, but personally, I don't think I'm looking to actually acquire a copy of it. It was just a neat time that I would recommend giving a shot because it's light and fun. I, specifically, if you like Push Your Luck. If you're not too into Push Your Luck, then just stay as far away from this one as you possibly can. Okay, we've now reached game number 16. My voice is doing okay so far, I think. And uh, this one is Nusfeard. This is the newest game to come out from um, humongous superstar board game designer Uwe Rosenberg. And um, a lot of people were excited about this one going into Spiel, specifically because people were excited every time Uwe Rosenberg puts out any kind of game. I mean, obviously, he's the one who did Agricola, Feast for Odin, uh, Caverna, Bonanza, lots of other games. And in Nusfjord, it seemed like it was going to be a lighter worker placement style game, but then it also had a stock market aspect going on. And that specifically is the reason why I avoided it at Spiel. I was like, I I don't know, like I, maybe I would have tried it, but I hate stock markets in games. Like honestly, mechanical stock markets, like where you buy into an, another person's stock and then you kind of worthwhile what they're doing, or maybe you're buying into a communal stock, which is going to affect, oh gosh, it just doesn't work for my brain. I suck at stock market games, so I avoid them. I, I think there could be good ones, uh, like Stockpile, for instance. I gave it a very good review, even though I said I would never play it again. But either way, coming back to Nusfjord, 
I avoided it because I heard there were stocks. And then we ended up having an opportunity to play this actually right after we played Gaia Project at BGGCon. And I'm glad I did get an opportunity to play it because the stock market thing was way oversold. Like you do have stocks and you can get them sold to your opponents. And the only real benefit to that is, well, first of all, any stocks you have in front of you at the end of the game that you have not sold are worth negative one point. And I think a winning score was like in the 30s. So minus one is definitely significant. Um, but uh, when a person buys a stock away from you, they'll get a point for it. And then when you generate fish, which is the main resource in this game, you actually have to pay out dividends to that stock by giving your opponent a fish. And that's kind of where the stock market thing ends. So it's it's not great giving your opponent's resources, but it was not that big of a deal. And the crux of this game, like really what's going on is you have a simple worker placement game where you are, um, you I think you have three workers a turn and it never changes. You always have three and you are just making a, bunch of fish. You're making a bunch of wood and you're making some gold and you're going to convert these things into buildings, which will maybe score you extra points. Maybe these buildings will give you ongoing benefits. There are these elders who you can kind of like recruit into your section of the neighborhood. And this part gets a little weird. <laughs> uh, if you want to activate an elder, you have to feed them and you feed them from this kind of communal uh, row of dishes full of fish because fish. And if there are no fish in this communal row, then you cannot activate the elder that you have in front of you. So you might be incentivized to put fish out on the row and that's a big way to get victory points in the game. So if you do that though, you put a bunch of these consumable things out that now your opponents can take to activate their elders. So that's kind of a wonky thing that did actually work. It worked out in the game and honestly, everything in the game worked. I had a pretty okay time with it. I walked away from the game thinking, sure, I would give that a shot again. It was kind of cute. It was simple. Um, I liked a lot of the things I was thinking about, but it was also bland and kind of boring. It was really boring for a couple of the people around the table. Uh, they definitely did not uh, feel engaged at all to this game. I felt somewhat engaged. And I think Matt did as well. And I would definitely try this one again, but it did not really seem like it did anything new. And for a simplified worker placement style game, I kind of feel like there's gotta be something to make me want to come back to it. Um, like kind of a catch here or there. And the stock market thing, was not really enough of a catch. And there's kind of a funky thing with the fish where you kind of like feed yourself and then feed your opponents and then kind of feed your elders as well. And that's kind of new, but not really either. So I guess at the end of the day, Nusfjord was okay. I tried again, but it didn't bring anything new to the table for me. So it uh, is pretty far down on this list. All right, we're starting to get closer to the bottom of the list. We now have game number 17, which is Pie Town. And um, well, I'll just go ahead and say that even though we're all the way down here at 17, I played a lot of fun games at BGGCon and I did have fun with this one as well as this fear that I just talked about. Like it's only the bottom two that I'm gonna <laughs> talk about really disliking. So anyway, let's go into Pie Town right here. And this is a simplified worker placement game that uses dice placement. But unlike most dice placement games, you never roll these workers. They are essentially counters. They come into the game as um, usually a one, and then as you do various actions out in the uh, game board, you will either uh, increase their value or decrease their value. And this game is all about baking pies. And so from a thematic perspective, that was a big hook for us. Like, that sounds fun. It's competitively baking pies, and you are just going out to the orchard to get a bunch of ingredients to bake into your pie. Then you're gonna go to your oven with a worker, and um, they're going to take these pies, put them out, down onto this main communal board, and then the pies on that board need to be sold. And the pies, there are like kind of like common pies. There are some pretty special pies with some better ingredients. And then there are the secret ingredient pies. At the beginning of the game, every single player is going to come up with a secret recipe. They're gonna put it into a little actual box with a lid, and whenever they bake that recipe, they're gonna get a seven point uh, pie, which is a lot better than the um, next best one, which is four points. The catch here though, is that this is supposed to be your secret pie recipe. And if one of your opponents figures out the recipe for your pie, they could also bake your secret recipe. They kind of put little tokens together, they show you in hiding, and if you agree that that is your recipe, then they also get to do one of those awesome seven point pies. And um, I think this is why the subtext for the game, I think is called pies, spies, and lies or something like that. So you are now going to need to spy on your opponents to figure out what their secret recipe is. You can kind of infer what it is based off of how they bake pies, but they're probably gonna try to bake two or three pies at once to kind of obscure what ingredients went into those pies. Cause you don't say, okay, these three make this pie, these three make that pie. You're just gonna say, these nine ingredients make this pie, this pie, and a secret recipe pie. And people have a little white board that they can kind of put with a dry eraser, some notes about what they think you might have, what they think you might not have. But 
A big part about figuring out what your opponent's secret recipe is, is spying on them by putting one of your dice on top of one of theirs in a couple of the areas on the board. And you look at the difference between the fit values. Like if I put a five down on top of a three, the difference is two. And I now get to secretly look at two random resources uh, or random secret ingredients for the person I just covered up. And I played this once. It got played a few times actually in my greater uh, friend group. And the game worked, like the worker placement stuff worked, um, the baking pies was fun, the trying to bake your own secret pies was good. The, the reason that so far down this list, even though we did have fun with the game, is that the secret pie thing never really seemed to matter all that much. Like, when you bake the regular pies, you can do a wide variety of combinations. Like, it's very easy to bake every single kind of pie except for secret ones. So I think the idea is that if you know the secret recipe of your opponent, you can now use that and your own secret recipe as extra oomph to get some secret pies made, and those are worth a lot more victory points. But nobody ever really seemed to do that. And at the end of the game, the only end game scoring is, well, you just liquidate all the pies in the market, and then you will make a guess about everybody's secret recipes. And you might get minus one to four points based off of how accurate a guess that is. And it just seemed like for being a game about secret recipes, we didn't care that much about the secret recipes. I, especially I heard that like in the second play by some people, they just went hog wild, just made a bunch of their own secret recipe and didn't really care that other people knew what it was and they did very well. Um, so I'm not really sure where I stand on this one. Like I enjoyed the experience. The uh, theme is wonderful. The components are wonderful. They're chunky, they're, they're great. Um, but I feel like the main conceit of the secret pie thing maybe didn't work out as well. So I, I would not mind giving this one another shot. Uh, to try and really kind of feel out uh, that whole aspect to it. I do think that there probably is more of a game in here than I maybe saw in that first play. I'm just not sure how much more of that will actually show itself. So anyway, that is Pie Town. At game number 18, we now have Kitchen Rush, which I guess kind of thematically matches up with Pie Town that I just talked about. In this case, we're not baking pies. We are instead trying to frantically run a restaurant. It is a real-time game. It's fully cooperative. And in order to do everything, you have... Um, kind of worker placement um, actions out on this main board, but every worker is a 30 second sand timer. So when you actually put the worker down, you flip it over, you do the action, which might be like taking goods out of the uh, storage, or maybe it's like actually cooking something on the, um, the top of the stove, and you can't touch that sand timer until the 30 seconds have elapsed, and then you can move it and go to somewhere else. Like maybe you keep cooking, or maybe you go to the spice cabinet where you pull these little spice cubes out of a bag, and it's frantic, it's frenetic, and it was pretty fun. Like we played it twice and the first game we did not win. And the second one, we think we might've, I'm not entirely sure if we did, if we were following all the rules um, uh, as closely as we uh, should have, but it was overall a fun experience. I'm not usually crazy about real time games. Um, I'm usually only tolerate them if they are fully cooperative, which this one was. And I think that's probably why it's so far down here. Like I had an okay time with the game. I don't think I was like an uproarious, amazing experience, but it was fun enough. There were a couple of things that kind of hampered it. Like some of the sand timers were really off. Like there was one that was like 19 seconds and there was another one that was like 90 seconds. So we obviously did not use the 90 second one. We were able to jigger it around to not need it. But that 19 second sand timer, like that's kind of like cheating, right? That means you can move it faster. You can get more stuff done within a given round. And I feel like that's maybe why we did so well the second time we played the game. Um, there were some fun kind of metagames that evolved because um, as you are trying to take these plates and then you put the food on them and then you're cooking them, you, all, you need to get the food from storage and the food's going to dry up in storage and somebody's going to have to go to the grocery store to buy more food. And a neat kind of thing formed where we ended up having just Matt be the store guy. Like he barely cooked anything every single round. He kind of left, left uh, the cooking dishes to everybody else to kind of make up for uh, his not cooking. And instead he was just constantly going to the store, just taking orders from everybody so that everybody else around the table is frantically moving their things around. They're like, I need more meat. We need more meat over there. I need, we need carrots, you know, that kind of thing. And Matt's like, okay. And he's spending money. He's getting the resources, putting it all down. And that was cool from an efficiency standpoint, but at the end of every round, you, um, you're going to get um, star points for the meals that you complete. You're also going to get money for the ones that you do correctly. Obviously, if you make a dish wrong, like if you don't heat it up enough or you put the wrong spice on it, you don't get these benefits. But um, you get this uh, money, and then you have to pay every single one of the workers three money at the end of the round, or else you won't have them in the next round of the game. So it was like this game of skinny margins of like getting a star or two and then getting like... 30 money and then spending 27 of it to keep our wages up for all of our workers. So we like, okay, cool. Well, we made three bucks last round, guys. Let's keep going. And the goal of the game is to try and have a certain threshold of money and a certain threshold of the stars. And yeah, it, it all came together well. Like I could see myself playing the game again, but I also 
have no problem uh, not going back to this one. Okay, we've now reached game number 19, and this is the first time I'm going to be officially disappointed in a game uh, for the convention. I mean, obviously, I've talked about 18 games so far, and I've enjoyed all of them to a certain extent. That is a great convention, but at 19, we have Kepler 3042. Uh, this one came out last year at Essen. In fact, I read the rules last year at BGGCon. I took it out of the library like three times, and every single time I didn't quite get it to the table. So when we um, saw it on the library, we decided to go ahead and give it a shot this time around, and we played a full game of it. It was a four-player experience, and well, I've already mentioned that I've been disappointed in it, but let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how the game works first. So the theming of this one is humans are trying to expand into the outer um, uh, galaxy, I guess, like they're trying to leave our solar system. And um, you have this big board with a bunch of hexagons on it, and um, kind of not in the center, but off to the side, you have our main solar system. And as you're playing the game, you're going to send out these ships that are going to go out to these new planets. And they're going to kind of colonize these planets and then maybe terraform the planets. Uh, terraforming gives you victory points, which is certainly good. And when, once they're colonized, you can use these planets to squeeze out resources to then build more ships and send those out. And it... I really liked a lot of this aspect to the game. Like this is a very strange game for me mentally. We played it, I think on the first day. So honestly, it's been um, many days since I played it. I'm trying to remember all the specifics of my pros and cons for it. But I really liked the aspects of like building spaceships, sending them out, trying to build up this kind of infrastructure of all of the different planets that you're doing. But then on the other hand, there were a lot of things that kind of disappointed me about the game. One of them being that when you go to a planet, it's face down, it's hidden. You don't know what it's gonna be until you flip it over and see what it is. And there is a action that you can do on your turn to flip over some of these things so that it's not a random surprise, but that's going to take an action on your turn. And the game, I believe, was 16 turns long. So that's one out of your 16 turns is going to do that and maybe get you a side fringe benefit as well. And so it didn't end up happening all that much. Like it happened to a certain extent, but there were definitely some coin flips that did not go well for certain people, which was a bit of a bummer. And again, you could blame yourself, but also you want to be efficient. You don't want to lose a whole turn just flipping over a thing to see if the thing that you wanted was actually there and you should go there anyway. So anyway, we should also talk about how the actions work because this is a really cool idea that I feel like just missed the mark. Um, we have a player board in front of us and it has a three by three grid. And so there are nine of these main actions that you can do. And they could be things like produce antimatter, produce goods on your planets, so maybe colonize planets, build ships, move your ships, all that kind of fun stuff. And then on each one of the three uh, columns and each one of the three rows, there is this extra benefit, like this extra ability that you can do. And these are cool. They do, they help you go up on these different tracks, which are going to give you uh, victory points. They also might allow you to build extra ships. They might let you uh, just get extra resources. But when you activate a spot in your three by three grid, you then, in order to use those bonuses, either the one that's above or the one that's over to the right, you have to permanently lose resources to do it. So you have this pool of cubes. They come in, I believe, three colors. And you have a you have three different um, places for these to go. One is kind of in a pending area. One is out on one of the planets so that you can use these resources to build stuff and terraform stuff. And the third is this kind of like black hole entropy thing that's on your player board where once a cube goes there, it's probably not going to leave anymore. And what this means is you are permanently reducing the amount of that resource that you could have out on your planets because it's lowering your ceiling for just those cubes out there because it's out of your pool. There are a couple ways to pull them back out of that um, entropy pit, but they're infrequent and they're hard to execute. And so what it means is this game was kind of a tease. <laughs> you have this action selection mechanism, which is neat, and you have these bonuses, which are great, and you want to do them, but if you want to evaluate both of them, you got to lose two of these things and they're gone and you don't have very many of these at all. So in the early phases of the game, like for the first five to six turns, we were all just doing it like crazy because it was fun. And then we got to like turn seven or eight and we're like, oh, wait a second. Oh crap, I've gotten rid of all my cubes. I now need to get these cubes back. There are, there's like a special type of planet that again, could be flipped over and you find that it's the right one. It's like mines. You could use those to pull these back from the entropy pit uh, that consumes a spaceship that you had to build and fly over to the mine. So that's a very expensive thing to do. And then there are a couple little tracks where you get a little uh, a bonus uh, pull out of the pit. You essentially get two free pulls to a certain extent free. You have to get to a certain spot, but it's easy to do. And then that's it. And I just, I didn't like this design decision. I feel like why taunt me with this really cool action selection mechanism and then not let me just do it every time. Like I want to 
do an action, and then just do the bonuses. Like design the game so that you do the thing and then you do the other things because tertiary, um, uh, well not tertiary, but secondary uh, actions on a turn are always fun and it adds extra little combo bonuses. Like don't penalize the player so hard or at least have them maybe spend resources from their planets so they go back into your resource pool and not out of the game in order to do all of these things so you can plan accordingly and be like, yes, that is worth that extra resource to do it. So I just, from a design perspective, this one really rubbed me the wrong way. Like I wanted to love it, but it just seemed overly punitive. And I think I've I've talked about Kepler a whole bunch already. And um, again, it's been so many days I'm having a hard time picking out all of my specific individual criticisms. I, I will say that when we ended the game, I felt like I would love to play Kepler 4032 or whatever, like a new streamlined version of this game that maybe comes back at it with a, a hard look at some of the decisions it made and maybe make it just a kinder, more interesting streamlined gaming experience than the one it was. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it, it's getting a reprint by Renegade, but I don't think they're going to change or tweak any of the rules and mechanics in it. So that's a little bit disappointing overall. There is also just, when it comes to randomness with the, the planet flipping, there's also a random event deck and you flip over a card and it could really help one person or another and you're not going to know when you kind of happen into it. I guess just the uh, the crux of what I'm trying to say is I really liked some uh, significant parts of the game and I really disliked some significant parts of the game. At the end of the day, the dislikes kind of outweighed the likes for me. So here we are. We finally reached game number 20. This is the one I disliked the most that I played at the convention, and that is Dragon's Gate College. This one debuted at Spiel. I actually got a uh, copy of it. It's right behind me on the shelf. I didn't bring it with me, but it was there in the library, and I'd already read the rules, and I was really intrigued to try it because I loved a lot of the ideas in this game, so I really wanted to give it a go. Um, so we ended up playing it at BGGCon. We played a four-player game of it, and it was... Very disappointing, unfortunately. Um, so the things that got me excited about this game are the central um, action mechanism is dice pool drafting, which I just enjoy in general. So you're going to roll a bunch of dice. They go into an area, and on your turn, you pick one of the remaining dice. You evaluate it according to the die face on a variety of different things around the board. And it's essentially Hogwarts, or you know, Harry Potter Hogwarts, the board game in a way, because you have a little school of magic, and you're trying to hire wizards who are going to be good, I guess not just wizards, you're trying to hire instructors that might be good at wizardry type things, or maybe like, you know, barbarian type things. Like, it's kind of like an RPG um, uh, D and D uh, setting, and you're getting these teachers in, and then you're getting apprentices in. And the teachers are gonna teach the apprentices, which are both tiles, on a little tile-laying tableau thing you have in front of you, and you can kind of send these apprentices out, and they will do not really adventures. That adventures they uh, are going to, um, I guess, just get better. Like they're no longer apprentice; they are now a much better uh, thief or something like that. And it's a very straightforward thing of like looking at all these tokens out on the board, and you're like, okay, they need to have this much skill in uh, thievery and that much skill in the other two things, and it matches up, so I'll go ahead and get rid of the apprentice and take the bonus, and now I need to get some more apprentices and put them down onto my area. A big thing that you're doing in this game is going to a construction spot and getting these kind of tetramino-shaped tiles and putting those down in front of the tableau that you have, which might unlock new spots for professors, new spots for apprentices, as well as just one-shot or ongoing bonuses, and the last thing that I loved about the idea of this game was that those dice that you rolled, well, some of them are neutral and some of them are player's colors. And if you activate a die that's your color, you get no bonus. But if one of your opponents activates your die, then you also get the activation of that die. You get a free turn. And as you're playing the game, you can modify the dice pool by adding more of your dice in so that it's more likely that people will activate your dice and you will get bonus turns. All these things sounded cool. They sounded great. I was really excited to try it. And then when we actually played it, it just didn't engage us at all. And on a lot of different levels, like we kind of commented that it felt like we were playing a, a play test of the game. Like, okay, this is in development. They're trying to feel this stuff out, but no, it's, it's a fully published game. And just a lot of the different things just didn't click for us. For instance, the dice pool thing, it just became obvious that it was a really good thing to swap out your dice into the pool. And when a couple of us were able to do it more than another person, that person kind of felt you know, bad about it. Like they just, they felt like they were kind of slipping behind, although they didn't end up being behind, I will uh, note. But it just, it seemed like kind of a no brainer kind of thing. It wasn't like super custom -y. It was just kind of like, okay, well, I have the ability to do this. I'm going to swap the die out. Of course, why wouldn't I do that? And uh, now you might be yelling at the screen and being like, no, I'm an expert Dragon's Gate player. And there are all these high level strategies that you can do that don't involve swapping your dice in. But for a first impression and a first play, it seemed like an obvious play. And okay, well, that's fine. So we, we did that. And then 
all the other decisions that we were doing with the dice, like they just felt wishy-washy. I mean, it's such a terrible term. I mean, I'm a reviewer. I'm supposed to have more articulate ideas, but it's, it's hard to really describe just what every single thing that we were doing in the game. We just did not feel super engaged by it. Like a lot of the stuff was kind of easy to do. Like you have this idea of like getting more um, of these instructors so that you can instruct your people really well. But I found that I, you start with two. I found that just getting a third one and then the various bonuses I got for doing other things got most of my tracks up really high anyway. So I didn't really feel like I needed to work too hard on getting new instructors. And it just kind of ended up feeling like an apprentice mill, like, okay, spend a die to get an apprentice, spend another die to get rid of the apprentice and then get a token and then spend a die to get another apprentice. And there's a couple other things like a little dungeon track that you can go down and there's ways to like convert things for money. But at the end of the day, first of all, our scores were funny. Um, I think Claire won with a score of 55 and then the other three of us tied at 54. So it was almost a four-way tie on this game. And then you know, when you're playing a game like that with that many victory points, the thought creeps in your head. You're like, well, either we're all equally good at this game or maybe our decisions didn't matter because everything is just equally valued. So no matter what I did, I got about the same amount of points because we all kind of ended at that same point. Like it didn't seem like we were supposed to be that clustered. It seemed like a couple of us were doing better than the others. Uh, but at the end of the day, we it was, I guess, anyone's game. And um, yeah, I mean, I've only played it once, so I can't be too much more articulate about my specific gripes with the game. All I can say is it was quite disappointing. It was long too. It was like two hours. I mean, it was at the end of a day. So part of that might be on us, but I didn't even feel like we had all that much downtime. It just seemed like it was just plodding on and we just didn't really care. And I think we were all happy when the game was over. So I'm not entirely sure if I'll be playing this one again. I guess it's possible um, that I might get another play of it in and see more to it and then maybe actually get to the point where I can review it. But at this point, uh, it was the biggest disappointment of BGGCon for me. Okay, let's now move on to the Shifting Shelf segment. This one is going to be pretty simple. I only acquired three games over the last month. Um, obviously, Eschen Spiel was a huge game acquisition month, but um, this time around, I only picked up one game at BGGCon. That was uh, Pulsar 2849, <laughs> looking at my notes. Um, it was a review copy from Czech Games Edition. Um, it's the same designer. It's uh, Vladimir Suchi, the same designer as Prodigals Club, which I loved. It's a dice pool drafting game, which I, in general, do like, so I'm excited to try that one out. And then I also got a review copy of Clank in Space and Sunday Split from Renegade Games. I haven't played any of these yet, but I am looking forward to giving these a shot I'll also amidst the sea of other games on my shelf that I still have not quite gotten to yet. Um, you'll also note that I did not need to remove any games from the collection. Um, that might be a little bit of a cheat. It's kind of hard to tell because uh, my games are kind of strewn around, a whole bunch, uh, around the house a whole bunch. And it would not surprise me if next month I do have to pull a couple off. I think I could still just barely fit it in here. So again, uh, no hard decisions of pulling things out just yet. So with that, we can wrap up this vlog. Uh, convention season is now over. I went to three this year instead of my uh, normal one of just going to BGGCon annually. Uh, it was a great year for uh, these conventions, going to Gen Con and Spiel for the first time. And uh, I now have a bunch of games that I need to play, like I just mentioned. Um, I think that Board Game Geek was a wonderful experience. I'm looking forward to um, hopefully going back again next year. Uh, two years from now, they're actually going to a new location that's not at the airport. And it's going to be twice as big, and it'll be interesting to see how the convention maybe changes. But uh, next year, I imagine it'll be a lot like this year, which was a lot like the previous three years. It's just a wonderful convention to go to and a really nice way to, I guess, round out the convention season. Like, pick up and try all those games that you maybe didn't get to at the previous ones. This is the first time I can actually say that, but it did seem to work out that way. So, yeah. I've talked a whole bunch. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up now, and uh, I will see you guys uh, next month either for the vlog or I do have a few more uh, playthroughs uh, coming out. I specifically have already filmed a playthrough for Rajas of the Kanji, so that one should be coming out soon. I'm also hoping to do Noria. Also, some reviews should hopefully be appearing soon as well, but right now I'm just playing a lot of things once. But either way, that is the end of this vlog. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel through Patreon, including all of these producer-level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, you could do so at patreon.com slash johngetsgames, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, if you'd like to see more of these annual monthly vlogs, as well as in-depth board game reviews and full game playthroughs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.